This is The Red Line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. If you were ever to travel just a thousand kilometers southeast of Miami, you'd arrive at the island of Hispaniola, an island home to two nations sitting at the very heart of the Caribbean islands. And if you were to take that opportunity, visit the Dominican Republic and travel down its beautiful Highway 45 in the west of the country, about halfway down the highway, you would find yourself standing on one of the greatest teachers about the importance of history anywhere in the world. As for a few kilometers of Highway 45, the road transits the exact same line drawn by the colonial powers back in 1679, dividing the island of Hispaniola into two distinct colonies. And if you were standing on that highway looking east, you'll find the former Spanish colony of the Dominican Republic. You would probably see a lush, green, beautiful landscape, and a country boasting a GDP per capita equivalent to nations like Serbia, Montenegro, or China. However, if you were stand at that same spot, but just turn around and face west, you would be looking to the former French colonial territory of Haiti. On the west half of the island, you'd see a highly deforested hillside, where the crops struggle to grow and the power doesn't work, and the GDP per capita, even just two small car lanes apart, drops to just one-sixth of the GDP per capita found in the eastern half of the island. And whilst your initial instinct might be to blame the government of Haiti, or blame a failing of public policy somewhere down the line, the truth here is actually far, far more complicated. As just a handful of decisions taken 200 years ago, and the reactions to those decisions by outside powers are still very much alive today. As when we move forward to the present, what we see is a nation where patchwork alliances of gangs control 80% of the capital city, a nation where homicides are daily occurrences, and a nation where power is currently being fought over between a man who was never officially sworn in, a man who was just released from a US federal prison a few months ago, and is now leading the armed forces of the environmental department, and a third individual who acquired his nickname through his well-known love of burning people alive. And these three, are the champions of the different movements currently vying for power in the growing battlefield that is Haiti. But how did we get here? What impacts do decisions from 200 years ago really make on a country today? And what future lies ahead for a nation who seems to feel the brunt of every single storm, every single time? Well, those are just some of the questions we're going to be answering here today. And to take us through what brought Haiti to the brink that we sit at today, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. A History of Hard Times First of all, despite what everyone sees in the news, Haiti is a remarkable place with a remarkable history. It's the first Black nation in the Americas. It also is the first nation anywhere in the Western world to permanently declare the abolition of slavery. But what we're more likely to hear about are Haiti's present day troubles. Marlena Doubt is a professor of French and African diaspora studies at Yale University, who's written several books on the history of the Haitian Revolution and is a noted scholar specializing in the literary cultures of the greater Caribbean, as well as being the co-creator and co-editor of the HNet Commons digital platform, H Haiti. So we're thrilled to have her on the program today. Haiti was almost destined to fail. Whether we're talking about the trade embargoes instituted against Haiti by the United States, to whether we're talking about France continuously trying to restore Saint-Domingue, which was Haiti's name under French rule, and reinstate slavery. They instituted an infamous indemnity by which required the Haitian government to pay 150 million francs or to agree to pay that amount as the price of freedom of recognition of their independence from France. And this amount doesn't take into account the fact that there were loans and fees and tariffs that continued to be paid until 1947. To put it mildly, these financial problems would hamper the Haitian economy for a very long time, with many of the nations having some reservations about trading with a nation who just removed slavery by force. So many of the nations who had used Haiti for a trading hub for a very long time all of a sudden began refusing to trade with them. And when you add to that the loans that the Haitians were forced to pay back to the French, those loans amounting to about six times the GDP of Haiti at the time, they very much put Haiti in a rough position to start with. And the problems kept coming, as with the French demanding these loans be paid, the Haitians would end up taking out huge loans from French banks, paying massive amounts of interest on loans taken from France to pay back the French. 
all whilst very little money was coming into the island, as the island's entire economic structure, built around exporting sugar and goods, had been completely uprooted overnight. So whilst other Caribbean islands and other countries within this region began to flourish and build up their economies, Haiti took a massive step backwards. And you can see the after effects of this still playing out today, as between themselves and the Dominican Republic, who inhabit the eastern half of the island, and didn't suffer the same kind of sanctions and lack of trade, there are massive stark differences between the two, with the GDP per capita in the Dominican Republic being four times that of what Haiti is today. And there's a lot to unpack there, so we'll go into that a bit later. For now, Malena, can you take us up to the 20th century, where after a series of assassinations and removal of presidents, all happening one after the other in a very short space of time, the US would launch an intervention onto the island in 1915. So can you take us through this first intervention and what impact it had on the country? And in 1915, after the assassination of Haiti's president, the United States uses that as a pretext to invade. But actually, the real reason was to force Haiti to pay back loans and amounts associated with the French indemnity in which U.S. banks, one of which is now Citibank. How we know this is because they were already the U.S. Marines off the coast sort of waiting for a pretext or some reason. And the year earlier, the United States had actually impounded $500,000 worth of gold stores from Haiti. And then if we kind of zoom forward, we can see that during the occupation that begins in 1915, but does not end until 1934. And so by the time they leave, they've kind of bequeathed to Haiti this sort of very militaristic policing system and a president handpicked and chosen by the U.S. government who is in fact pro-U.S. And this is a situation that would persist throughout the 20th century, even before we get to another formal intervention by the United States in the 1990s after the coup d'etat against Jean-Bertrand Aristide. So all of this has a very long history, which is why it makes offering kind of simple solutions like, oh, well, we'll just send another occupation, very complicated because Haiti has a long history of foreign occupations called interventions, and none of them have ever worked in the long term, and it's debatable whether they worked in the short term, or rather for whom they worked. So after the US leaves in 1934, the country somewhat stabilizes for a little bit, but then very quickly falls back into a series of coups and military dictatorships that one by one keep bumping each other off, until eventually a US-supported president, Francois Duvalier, comes to power in 1957. Now, Duvalier, for somewhat understandable reasons, didn't trust the military as far as he could throw them, and ends up building his own competing military structure, one solely loyal to him, to directly compete with the existing military. Now, this new military structure he builds ends up being twice as large as the official military within the space of just four years, with more money being diverted away from programs and the military to commanders who are personally loyal to Duvalier. So can you take us through his leadership and how this transition away from the conventional military structures to ones far more centralized, have ended up having major impacts on the country today. François Duvalier, known as Papa Doc, is the pro-U.S. candidate. Well, what does Duvalier do? Well, later he declares himself president for life, and he creates a repressive police force that comes to be known as the Tonton Makout. And this is a time in which there's a complete crackdown on intellectuals, on universities, on journalists, whisper, can get somebody disappeared or even killed, and there's a high level of fear. Well, when he dies unexpectedly, his 19-year-old son, Jean-Claude Duvalier, comes to power. He's known as Baby Doc, and he continues on this path with the Tonto Macout until February 1986, when there is the final sort of ouster of the Duvalier regime, and that is actually the moment when Haitians had hope that a true democracy would take root. Now, unfortunately, even though there was this optimism at the time, having finally removed the Duvalier family from the center of Haitian politics, unfortunately, a lot of the old problems would come back again, with Haiti then going through nine leaders in the next eight years, and the vast majority of those leaders also coming from the military parties. That was until Jean Bertrand Aristide, who had come to power in Haiti in 1993, before then being removed in May 1994, reinstated in October 1994, removed in 1996, and reinstated back in 2001. But in 1994, there was high hopes for Haiti, with the new Clinton administration vowing to take serious steps to stabilize and improve the living standards on the island, seeking to do this by pushing the island through a wide series of economic reforms, 
Now, during the 1980s, before these reforms, the country had been largely self-sufficient food-wise, with staples like rice making up very large parts of the Haitian diet. But once these reforms came in during 1994, the country would go through a whole series of changes, including reducing their tariffs from 35% to just 3%, the lowest anywhere in the Caribbean at the time, and open up their food and staples markets to the rest of the world. Now, what happened very quickly is that the price of everything, particularly for food, dropped rapidly for the people of Haiti. As when it comes to things like rice, the US gives large subsidies to their own rice farmers, who also produce at a much larger scale, which initially was a massive help for the Haitian people, as the citizens of Haiti could now readily and easily buy this far cheaper US rice and food, having more money to spend on other things. But as an after effect of this policy, most of Haiti's farms and productions, who had been protected by these tariffs, very quickly went bankrupt. And with no local production, it meant that the citizens increasingly kept turning to the US to supply their goods and needs, with the US very quickly becoming the source of over 90% of Haiti's rice and staples. Now with the country becoming ultra-reliant on imports, there are all sorts of effects right throughout the economy, as well as the currency, which quickly begins to sputter and have problems of its own. And Haiti at this point enters a vicious cycle, where the outside market forces industry to shut down, so they rely more on imports, which kills more local industries, so they rely more on imports, which kills more local industries. Now, chuck an earthquake in 2010 on top of that that kills 300,000 people and destroys most of the remaining infrastructure in the country, and we very quickly have a recipe for disaster here, leading to a situation where today, due to the cutting of regulations around farming standards in the US, US companies who dominate the Haitian food market today now send their lower grade rice into Haiti, with numerous reports coming out that the rice these US companies end up sending to Haiti also contain arsenic levels that are more than double that of the safe level. So after these economic reforms, a complete reliance on the US, a devastating earthquake in 2010, and now the primary source of food coming into the country having levels of arsenic that are far higher than what is deemed safe, we can quickly see how we're arriving at some of these problems later down the line. But these weren't the only effects that came from those 1994 reforms. So can you take us through what those 94 reforms did to the food and rice markets, as well as other parts of the Haitian economy? This basically destroys the rice industry in Haiti, and rice is not the only product. We have the Creole pig fiasco as well, in which Haitians were required to basically kill every pig when these pigs were so important to families. This was like, uh, Haitians describe it like a bank account. You could keep your pig and you could, when your child is ready to go to school, kill that pig and make enough money to send your child to school, that this was considered a family savings account. The rice farmers moved into the city. There was sort of this massive exodus into Port-au-Prince, which was not designed to carry these millions of people and created a massive population crisis, a housing crisis, a job crisis, because there weren't factory jobs for all of these individuals. There weren't housing for these individuals. And then instead of being producers of food for export and for subsistence, Haitians became consumers. And so Club Med came, Princess Cruises came, the Marriott came, Best Western came. And we said, oh, progress. But actually what it does is destroy the Haitian economy in those very realms. And those moves also had other effects that ratcheted up tensions on the island, as no longer having Duvalier to answer to, and not having any domestic industries working that they can skim money from. Many of those well-armed paramilitary forces we talked about earlier on now turn to other means to earn their money, with many of these forces and troops forming the basis of a lot of the gangs and criminal organizations that dominate the Haitian landscape today. So can you take us through how this transition happened and why it happened? These are really armed paramilitary groups. Many of the members, especially the leaders of these quote unquote organizations, have UN backed training because they were trained as UN security forces during the, the previous UN occupation that was called MINUSTA, or they were members of the Haitian National Police, again, also a UN kind of trained force, and they get these weapons from the United States. So I would say it was a kind of another watershed moment when Aristide had disbanded the military because that was who overthrew him in the first place. And then in place of that, there was just this sort of street gang movement of getting what you want done and getting your way, whether that's contracts for telephone contracts, whatever it may be. These 
are trained individuals who have political aspirations and goals. Many of the leaders of the various groups in Haiti right now have political aspirations, talk about wanting to be presidents, if not kings and emperors. It puts the Haitian people in a rock and a hard place because some of them are the only ones actually opposing and calling increasing attention to the fact that this situation is not unfolding in any democratic way, shape or form, no matter how you look at it this many years after the assassination in particular. So let's unpack that assassination for a moment. As in 2021, right near the end of his term, Jovenel Moïse, the president of Haiti, was assassinated in his home by a group of 28 foreign mercenaries, many of which being Colombian nationals hired by a company based in Florida. And this event, more than anything else, lit the powder keg that brought us into the political crisis Haiti is going through today. So can you take us through the assassination as well as the ensuing fallout that came from it? So Jovenel Moise was assassinated on July 7th, 2021, is assassinated in his bed in the middle of the night with his wife next to him. And pretty quickly, there became a sort of succession crisis. And the best way that I can explain it and how I talk to my students about it is if, for example, on January 6th, Donald Trump had succeeded in delaying Congress from ratifying the presidency of Joe Biden and he's and he stayed in office for, let's say, one year, right? And then finally, some other force comes in and forces him to abdicate and he's forced to leave. Then the question is, does Joe Biden's presidency end in its normal term or does he get four years tacked on? So that's what happened in this case, except it happened with the election. The election did not happen on its schedule for very complicated reasons. And so Moise took office late, but technically his term had already started. So Haitians were saying that his five-year term was up. He was saying no, that his, that his five-year term was not up. And so at the moment of the assassination, this is the standoff that we are in. Haitians are saying his term is over. He's saying no, he still has one year left. As to who is responsible for it, at this point, there have been many people accused. There have been some people tried and convicted in Miami. There have been accusations against Moise's own wife that some people consider these accusations just completely rid ridiculous and kind of like political theater, if you will. And then the larger question is that since Moise, his mandate was up, according to the vast majority of the Haitian populace, who is the rightful successor to Moise? Well, his prime minister at the time was a man named Claude Joseph, but actually he was being replaced. Moise had already named his successor. And who was that successor? It was Ariel Henry. And so even though he hadn't been sworn in, the core group and other entities swooped in and said, this is the person who's going to lead. And so that's how we got to this current situation that we're in. And because of the way Henri was named to be de facto president or prime minister, if you will, there have been questions about whether or not he was involved and had some vested interest in the assassination of Haiti's president as well. So that's all just to say there are still so many questions. There are not a whole lot of answers, and it will be very difficult to get those answers under a regime that has an interest in not going to investigate him. And now you have a situation where violence is rampant in the country. Paramilitary forces have morphed into various gangs that control parts of the city, the economies in tatters, and a de facto prime minister, who still hadn't gone through that transition or been sworn in, is now running the country, that being Ariel Henry. And things get even more complicated again, as Henry has continued to push back the elections on the guise of waiting until the situation could become secure enough to hold the election. But he's pushed the elections back so far now that every single one of the elected officials that had been elected to the government has now had their terms expire, meaning that the entire government now is out of office. And Haiti is effectively now flying with only Henri at the helm with what powers he actually has in this de facto state being ambiguous at best. So what effect is this having on Haitian society at the moment? They have basically no elected officials at this point. The country is at a standstill. Insecurity is at its highest point. And this is the question when people say, well, how can it be solved without further violence? And that seems to be the question that's never on the table anymore, right? is how can we solve this process by respecting human life in Haiti and respecting justice and order, which are things that people love to say. We want law and order. We want democracy in Haiti, except Haitians aren't able to go to school normally. They're not able to live in the cities, especially in Port-au-Prince. 
they're not able to live these full lives in safety and security. And the only way that that can happen is if the Haitian people themselves are the ones who are in fact allowed to determine the next steps. So we're now arriving at the present in the country, coming off a situation where for centuries, at nearly every single turn, the country has been knocked down time and time again. And at present, the population wrangles with the fact that there's no government, there's minimal rule of law, no economic prospects, and a constitutional crisis currently underway. But what are things like on the ground at the moment? Who is running the show? And is there a solution on the table that others seem to be missing? Well, to answer that, we turn to our second guest. Part 2. Governing at Gunpoint I moved to Haiti in July of 2016, and I learned to speak Creole quite fluently and got to know Haiti outside of the capital. My last few years were spent living in Port-au-Prince specifically, covering armed conflict. In 2016, there would be some protests here and there, but more or less, it was quite easy to move across the country. But by the summer of 2018 happened around the Petro Caribe scandal, that's when things started to shift and it just kind of spiraled from there. Jess Depiro obert is an award-winning investigative journalist based in Haiti, where she's worked since 2016. Jess's work is primarily focused on solution-based storytelling around armed conflict, women and mental health within Latin America and the Caribbean. Publishing with numerous outfits such as The New Humanitarian, The Guardian, The Economist, Reuters, Al Jazeera, The New York Times, and many, many more. So we're thrilled to have on the program today. The president was assassinated in July 2021, and the Prime Minister Ariel Henry has held power since then with no elected body behind him. And he just recently announced elections would be held possibly in the summer of 2025 and is currently in Puerto Rico after coming back from Kenya, where he has been trying to get a police force to come in as a sort of intervention in Haiti to take care of the spiraling armed gangs that are controlling more than 80% of the capital. For someone living in Port-au-Prince at the moment, how widespread are the influence of these gangs? They have infiltrated pretty much everything. You cannot leave Port-au-Prince. There are checkpoints. There's like a mountain called Mont Cabrit that connects Port-au-Prince to Mirabele, the central plateau, that's completely controlled by a gang called Katsant Mawazo. And on February 18th, for example, the gang decided to open fire on more than 10 people in a public bus just trying to get from Port-au-Prince to, to Mirabele. And since then, it's been pretty much impossible to get in and out of the city. Many of these gangs we're talking about have their roots back in the days of Duvalier, having been armed, trained and boosted up as a counterforce to the military and police who consistently cooed presidents over the years. However, having continuously given them more and more leeway, arms and power, in the end they ended up becoming even more powerful than the forces trying to govern them. Now, right now the reports are stating there's around 200 gangs operating across the country. However, just in recent weeks, we're seeing a new trend taking place in the country, with more and more of these gangs now forming alliances or being absorbed under the command of one or two of these much larger players. Now, at the moment, these gangs control about 80 to 85% of the country's capital, Port-au-Prince, including the airports, the ports, the fuel terminals, the communication centers, major highways and checkpoints, and a whole bunch of the infrastructure that people are relying on for their day-to-day -day living, meaning that a few of these larger groups are now in complete control of what is coming in and out of the city, which is one of the reasons that the president currently can't even land back in his own country, as gangs who stand in direct opposition to Henri are currently in control of the country's major airport. Even just two days ago, we saw a situation where these gangs stormed the country's largest prison, and in turn released 95% of the prisoners being held there, in an effort to further boost their ranks and additionally demonstrate the weakness of the current government. And the official Haitian government, as well as the police forces, could really do nothing about it. In fact, they can't even take the country's fuel terminals back, meaning that the government currently has to rely on these gangs for fuel to keep the lights on in their government buildings, let alone any sort of attempt to try and push them out of the capital. But how are these gangs getting to this point? How are they funded? And how do they get to a point where they can pull all this off? 
So a lot of these armed groups are using kidnappings, they're using bribes, they're extorting individuals through building these checkpoints where you have to pay to pass. I'll give an example for Morn Cabri. If you wanted to pass as just like a bus, you would have to pay $75 US one way to get out of Port-au-Prince to Mirabelle. And then the trucks that are transporting goods would have to pay even more than that. So part of their money is coming through these extortions, these bribes, and it's also through the kidnappings, it's through drug trafficking, it's through a, a lot of different means. And it's also sort of funded by some of these businessmen and politicians with their own goals in mind, and it's kind of this proxy conflict. So at this point, I think we should take a few moments and talk about who the major political players are here of vying for the leadership of Haiti, as all three of these guys have some pretty interesting backgrounds, to put it mildly. Now, the first contender we're going to talk about is the country's acting prime minister, Ariel Henry, who we talked about a little bit early on in the episode. Now, Henry is a neurosurgeon by trade who went to politics back in the early 2000s and as part of the movement to topple jean Bertrand Aristide. Now, upon Aristide being removed from politics, Henri was placed in a de facto role, becoming part of the Council of Sages, which was effectively a council of seven members of Haitian society that had been backed by the United States, and served as a transitional government after the 04 coup, which sounds oddly familiar to his situation at the moment. Now, Henri would then go on to be a upper middle level bureaucrat in Haitian politics for the next few years, becoming a major part of the US programs to support Haiti after the 2010 earthquake. However, due to political infighting, he would be actually forced from the government in 2015, and for the most part would walk away from Haitian politics for a few years, until six years later in 2021, when he would reappear on the scene during the transition from his outgoing government into the military party. Now, when he got tapped for this role as prime minister for the transition period, he hadn't actually been sworn to power yet. And two days after being tapped, Moisey, the outgoing president, would then be assassinated by a private military firm working out of Miami. And in the chaos of the situation, Henry would then step over and take control of the government under the guise that, well, technically he was acting as the PM at the time. And even though the US had recognized the incoming government previously, Washington would then change its mind and then back Henry to head up the government during the stabilization period before they could run another election or sort out a transition of government. Although here we are in 2024 in the same situation. So that's our first player. Ariel Henry, the current acting prime minister. So our second candidate here is a man named Jimmy Cherizier, but better known as Barbecue, the name supposedly being a homage to his favorite chicken shop, but it's more widely reported that the name originates from his penchant for setting people he doesn't like on fire. Now, Barbecue is a former police officer in Haiti who would later go on to become a very large gang leader in the country, perpetrating multiple large-scale massacres. But it is alleged that whilst he was still a police officer, Barbecue was the one who perpetrated the 2018 La Saline Massacre, which killed over 70 people and let 400 homes burn down. He's also accused of masterminding the 2017 Grand Ravine Massacre and the 2019 Bel Air Massacre. Now, in 2018, Barbecue was then fired by the Haitian National Police, allegedly for ties to organized crime. Although that probably didn't hurt his pay packet very much, as by that point in time, he was already in charge of an alliance of gangs known as the G9, a federation of gangs mostly based in the capital. Now, this group was originally composed of just nine gangs, but in recent times has been gaining more and more gangs, people slotting under Barbecue's control. Now, previously, Barbecue had been a close ally of the assassinated president, even allegedly receiving lots of money and weapons from the president, so his gang could become more powerful and take out more of the smaller gangs, in somewhat of an effort to clean up the streets. However, over time, Barbecue would eventually turn on the president, and just a week before the president would be assassinated, Violence on the streets of Haiti would sharply rise, and Barbecue would demand that Moisey step down and he be put in charge of the country. Today, he still leads G9 and an increasing amount of gangs in the country, and is probably become the most powerful man in Haiti at the moment. And the third and final major player here is a man named Guy Philippe. Now, out of these three men, Guy has probably the strangest story, as during his teens, he served within the country's death squads, targeting political rivals and using violence right across the country and supposedly he was quite effective at this. Fast forwarding though, after his work as part of the death squads, Philippe would then be made a commander within the Haitian National Police, and would play a major part within the political violence of the year 2000. However, after that violence and coup attempt though, Philippe would flee the country, running over the border into the Dominican Republic, where at that point he allegedly received training from the US intelligence services. Philippe would then re-enter the country in 2001 to carry out attacks on the Haitian police academy. Then later in 2004, he would return for the Dominican Republic, 
at the head of a paramilitary group to play a major part within the 2004 Haitian coup against President jean bertrand Aristide. Yes, the same one that Henri was involved in. Now, after the coup, he would take control of the country's army and serve as a major power broker within Haiti. And once in that position, he would then try to run for president in 2005. However, lost the vote. And since he weakness, his opponent would then work with the United States to help get drug and money laundering charges put on Philippe. Now, rather than going to jail for these crimes, Philippe was then allowed to instead go into exile in his rural Haitian hometown. And that's where he sat for almost a decade, until he reappeared on the scene back in 2015 to run for a seat within the Haitian Senate. Now, he would actually go on to win that seat, but only a few days after he won the position, the United States would reappear back on the scene, properly arrest him, and bring him back to the United States, placing him within a US federal prison, all of which was done before his senatorial immunity would kick in. And this is where he was supposed to stay for the next decade or so, not due to be released until 2028. However, fast forward a few years, and mysteriously, in September last year, the US government decided that it would drop all charges against Philippe, and immediately put him on a plane and fly him back to Haiti. Which, somewhat suspiciously, by the time his plane got to Haiti, there were already people at the airport wearing shirts calling for him to be the next president, even though his release from prison hadn't been announced by that point. From there, he would travel back into the south of the country, where he would meet up with the armed forces of the BSAP, which is effectively Haiti's environment agency, so something similar to the US EPA, except very well armed and very willing to fight. Now, upon acquiring lots of arms and additional weaponry for the BSAP, Philippe would also begin reactivating a lot of the same commanders and soldiers that he used to carry out the 04 coup, and bolstering the BSAP into a pretty functional and aggressive armed force with this force now openly engaging in firefights with the national police, all whilst Philippe tours the country, giving speeches and calling for him to be made the next president of Haiti. So now we have Philippe calling for Henri to step down and for him to be made the president. Barbecue is calling for Henri to step down and be made the president, even threatening that he will carry out a genocide or civil war if Henri refuses to make him the president. And we have Henri who refuses to step down and instead declared a state of emergency and stated that he will be holding elections in August of 2025. And with these three gentlemen being our main players, it's somewhat easy to see why the country isn't in a great political position going forward. So just how do you solve something like this? What are the actual moves on the table at the moment that could possibly fix something like this? I'm not sure. I, I would say that the US needs to sanction more of some of these people that are implicated in a lot of the goings on with the armed groups, the arms trafficking, the drug trafficking that's in the country. There needs to be a sort of cleaning out of the government and of the political elite and some sort of transitional council because a lot of it's going to come down to civil society. It's going to come down to the funding of the police force and giving them really what they need to be able to take care of the armed groups and get some sort of security and more accountability, like a, a justice system that's bolstered to be able to actually hold the political elite accountable. Do you think this is something that could be solved by international intervention? I spent a lot of time talking to different civil society actors, activists, people living in some of these slum areas and different leaders around the country about what they think of a security force coming in. Most are not for it, but I would say that those living and very much affected by the violence day in and day out, probably wanting a force to come in to establish some sort of security. Most that I've talked to are wondering why their own police force can't take care of this, why there's not more training or money put into an actual Haitian police force and army that is both trustworthy and able to actually deal with the problem themselves. I spoke to an activist, Valina Charlier, who is also part of the New Pop Domi movement. And her quote to me was, there's no nation in the entire world that's built their security from outsourcing the force. The security of a nation is like the responsibility of the nation. So most people I speak to want more economic production in the country. They want a bolstering of the justice system. So there needs to be, you know, a addressing of impunity. There needs to be clean politicians. They want all these people working together so that they can have a cleaner government, essentially. Well, looking at how things are set at the moment, do you think it's more likely to get better or worse in the country over the next few months? In Haiti, we're always kind of saying it can't get much worse than it has, but it, I've kind of learned to stop saying that because oftentimes uh, it does. 
So the situation in Haiti currently seems to be a decision between a man whose nickname is related to the fact he loves to set people on fire, a man who's fresh out of US federal prison, and wielding an environmental department that is armed to the teeth with US rivals, and a man who is currently getting every mile he possibly can out of that acting in front of his prime minister title. So how do you solve a problem like this? Surely the priority now is to just stabilize the situation, rerun elections, and try and bring some sort of normalcy back to the country. And the obvious solution to that is an international intervention. Bring in a force, push back the gangs, restore sanity on the streets, and run a democratic election. And if we achieve that, then surely the country will be stable in the long term. And while this may not have worked in the long term during the previous seven interventions into Haiti, maybe this eighth one will be the charm. Will this new intervention finally be the one to solve the crisis in Haiti? Or will it become another failure to add to the board? And who is going to be the force behind another intervention into Haiti, as more and more countries seem hesitant to get more involved in the country? Well, to answer all those questions, we turn to our third guest. Part 3. Raid and Repeat Uh, so uh, what you have now, the two main uh, gang coalitions, uh, G9 and, and GPEP, uh, have uh, now combined forces uh, you know, through a uh, collaboration that they call uh, Viva and Sam. But it's important to recall that uh, these gangs are really empowered by arms, they're empowered by illicit money, they're empowered by, by extortion, and effectively they have now become more powerful than the police force itself. Evan Ellis is a professor of strategic studies specializing in Latin America and the Caribbean at the U.S. Army War College's Strategic Studies Institute. He's also the author of an amazing substack outlining the latest events taking place in the region, and prior to that, he worked for the U.S. Secretary of State's policy planning staff, with responsibilities for Latin America, the Caribbean, the international narcotics trade, and cross-border law enforcement matters. So we're thrilled to have him back on the program today. In addition, the various different forces that would come in to, to try to address the situation, the United Nations force, are coming into a very difficult urban combat environment in which not only a, a lack of knowledge of that local situation and, and that uh, type of combat, but also the gang willingness to blend into the civilian population makes it a very intractable problem. As well as uh, even if you get to the restoration of a semblance of order with respect to the gangs, uh, you also have to address the underlying issue of uh, political legitimacy, remembering that the Ariel Henry uh, government has not had uh, elections for, for quite some time. You have not had an elected Congress in power for quite some time. So just getting to a government that has uh, legitimacy with the major uh, brokers so I want to start here by asking your thoughts about the proposed intervention into Haiti that's been approved by the UN Security Council, with this intervention force being led by the Kenyans, and including troops from Kenya, Mali, Jamaica, the Bahamas, Senegal, Belize, Burundi, Chad, and Antigua and Barbuda, with the US footing the majority of the bill for the intervention, as well as pledging additional support to Kenya in its fight against Al-Shabaab. So why is this structure being chosen for the intervention? Well, it is not a United Nations peacekeeping force. It is effectively a United Nations sanctioned peacekeeping force. And there's an important difference. Uh, what you can do depends on the political will of each of the countries and especially the country who is, is leading them. But with respect to the rules of engagement, which are going to be critical, on the one hand, will these forces try to go after the gangs, um, in which case you have, again, operations, urban terrain, where you can have civilian casualties and, and uh, some significant issues. These gangs are very highly armed and, and know the terrain well and can blend into the population. And the, the peacekeepers that uh, we're talking about uh, right now would not necessarily be coming in with significant sophisticated equipment or, or capability. I mean, the question of what level of, of armor they would be bringing into the, the streets are, are not clear. But it is in some ways you know, not entirely certain that this peacekeeping might uh, simply be trying to establish a semblance of order or maybe even trying to patrol or, or keep uh, roadways open. All of those things imply different levels of risk, but also different levels to which the force would become a, a target, uh, would become uh, potentially a part of the problem. 
In addition to that, of course, there's the whole question of both the funding and the actual composition of the force. And so the estimate is that you would need at least 5,000, if not uh, more uh, persons in such a force, remembering that the previous force, the Minista force, uh, had uh, over 6,000 people. You would also need something uh, on the order of 250 to $300 million per year to operate such a force. Now, while the United States has pledged $200 million and other states have pledged a little bit. The actual money that's gone into the coffers, I believe the formal pledges have been less than 80 million. And the amount of money that's actually deposited in the bank to date has only been about $11 million. So the funding in the question and the who contributes to the forces in question. This is all particularly relevant at the moment with Omri having traveled to Kenya after the Kenyan Supreme Court laid down a ruling blocking the intervention from going forward. Now, the trouble for Omri is that as he was due to come home, Barbecue made major plays back in Haiti. And now Omri can't land back in Haiti's airport, as Barbecue Alliance forces are now in control of the airport. So Omri is now reportedly still sitting in Puerto Rico, trying to find an avenue back into Haiti. So can you take us through why Omri was in Kenya in the first place? And what sort of considerations Kenya will have to make going into this operation? As one is aware, the reason why Ariel Henry, the Haitian prime minister, was in Kenya was to try to finalize this deal, which has been blocked by the Kenyan Supreme Court regarding the sending of the Kenyans, which would only be about a thousand people. The state of Mali has committed a number of people. Uh, I believe Benin has, has committed uh, people as well, but uh, you know, the nature of that is, is somewhat uh, uncertain. A range of other states uh, from you know, Latin American Caribbean states, such as uh, Barbados, the Bahamas, Jamaica have pledged uh, small forces, but, but again, uh, not clear whether they would have the capabilities. Part of the irony is that uh, many of the states that have most experience in Haiti, having contributed to the Minista force from 2004 over, over that decade, have been a little bit more reluctant to contribute forces to, to this. On the other hand, African uh, countries, uh, which have arguably uh, some ties with respect to the language and, and cultural ties, but uh, really lack their own capabilities in, in urban combat. The question is not only the effectiveness, but also some of the potential dangers. We can remember that in the Minista peacekeeping force, that force was associated with the accusations of bad behavior, including some issues of, of sexual violence, as well as the association of, of the Pakistani contingent with the cholera epidemic that broke out in Haiti, which ended up killing something like 10,000 Haitians. And so just the very issue of the peacekeeping force and its ability to solve versus contribute to problems uh, is really another big unknown chapter and when we look at the situation unfolding. So obviously Kenya isn't going to be bringing in its fuel, water and supplies all the way from Nairobi for this operation. So how will the logistics and supply work on this one? Typically, in a number of other uh, peacekeeping operations in Africa and elsewhere, it has actually been the U.S. or, or other uh, wealthier countries that have supplied the equipment that allows those forces to contribute. Indeed, oftentimes, when the forces volunteer to contribute to, the, to send peacekeepers, the expectation is that some other country, uh, generally the United States, would actually even pay the bill for their training and, and salary and other things. And so sometimes these countries see it as, as effectively a, a money-making operation. And indeed, uh, you know, in addition to the equipping of the soldiers themselves, there's the broader question of the sustainment of those. And as you point out, it would largely fall to the United States. And yet the details of how presumably a U.S. Southern Command led efforts to provide that support, at least publicly, I have not seen any, any, any clear commitments to how that plan is, is going to work out. And it's probably difficult to work out that plan until there's clarity over who is actually coming, whether the Kenyans or, or others. Now, it should be said, though, that Kenya wasn't the U.S.'s first choice to lead this operation. So for this intervention, the Americans actually approached Canada to fill in for the role. But Canada said no. And after Canada, they then approached Brazil, who also said no. So Brazil's been quite successful with their peacekeeping operations in this area of the world before. So why did Brazil push back on this one? It's a great point. And, and clearly, the dog that didn't bark is the Brazilians. We can recall that not only did the Brazilians uh, lead the previous Minista force, uh, but it's the Brazilians that have uh, one of the best respected international peacekeeping schools in, in the region, if not globally, uh, Seco Pab. Uh, and so the, the fact that the Brazilians did not pony up for leadership and, and really even for a substantial contribution, I think it's a reflection in part in, of the difficult situation that the new Lula government finds itself in right now in the sense that uh, the Haitian operation is full of, of downsides in terms of inadvertently involved 
involving Brazil in, in combat operations where it has other difficulties. Some in Brazil that I've spoken to also suggest that there may be a political dimension of this, which is that especially after the events of, of January 8th with the previous president, Jair Bolsonaro, that President Lula, although he has tried to appoint military leadership loyal to him, and, and although certainly there's never been any question of the loyalty of the Brazilian military, we're just coming off of a week in which uh, uh, documents were made apparent that uh, Bolsonaro had uh, tried to um, float a plan to, to the military to prevent the assumption of, of power uh, by Lula da Silva. And so with the Lula government, uh, there are a lot of sensitivities with respect to the use of, of the military as part of a major foreign policy agenda, uh, by contrast to the way things were uh, back in 2004. So if the US effectively wants to kit this operation out, transport all the people there and all the logistics, whilst still making sure that it's the Kenyans who are the ones taking the risk, what sort of equipment and logistics are the US going to have to look at to be able to actually successfully pull something like this off? You know, are we looking at tents and picnic rugs, or are we looking at tanks and heavy machine guns? Of Kenya, you know, there's a question of, of whether it is adequately strong to lead a multinational force. That involves uh, a commitment and the rules of engagement that let you go after the gangs, but to do so in a way that doesn't mess you in a political quagmire, operating against essentially plainclothes gang members in an area that you do not have significant local knowledge of. Obviously, also a commitment to long-term funding. So you know, in the present case, the ability to get the 250 to $300 million a year and actually have that money in the bank to ensure that you, know, you don't have peacekeeping force on, on a shoestring, especially when the key players are depending on the budget to have adequate training and adequate equipment of the forces going in, making sure that you know you have both non-lethal weapons as well as lethal force, so you know avoid unnecessary civilian casualties. That you have a capability for detecting and moving again, so you minimize your casualties and prospect of ambush. You have adequate mobility. You have adequate force protection that involves armored vehicles that are resistant against the, the level of munitions that could be used against you which in, in the case of Haiti involves up to 50 caliber weapons that are in the hands of, of the gangs. I think at this point it might be pertinent to ask why the Haitian army isn't carrying out this kind of task. Where is Haiti's army in all of this? Of the once 16,000 Haitian National Police, that's dissolved away over, over recent years. They've even gone on strike because they, they feel that they are they're just completely unsupported and outgunned. Even in the last year, something like 1,600 of those Haitian police just abandoned their posts. So maybe 9,000 remain, and of those 9,000, 3,000 are, are combat effective. You have a maybe 500-person under-equipped Haitian army that they're trying to get up and started. So that force is, is clearly not in a capability to deal with the gangs. Now, with this explicit effort by the gangs under this cooperation agreement, the Vivan Sam, to really try to destabilize the country to force elections, you need at least some type of force that can either replace that or you're in a condition where you are negotiating with the gangs for their leadership. So just for a second, I want to add a, bit, a little bit of context around those numbers and explain how absolutely crazy that is. If we were to take New York City, the population of around eight and a bit million people, and then we take all of the problems that Haiti's had historically that have led up to this moment, and we put that all in New York, and then we slap another three and a half million people into the city all of a sudden, and then we reduce our police force by 92%. That's the reality of what Haiti's dealing with at the moment. Trying to run nearly New York and a half on a police force that is roughly equivalent to what they run in New Hampshire. That there is the reality of what Haiti is dealing with at the moment. Now, with things being this chaotic on the ground at the moment, bringing back some sort of stability is the name of the game. If we can build some level of stability, then we can start building up other things from there. And looking at what we have on the table at the moment, it seems pretty unlikely that any of these methods are going to get us to that point. So I'll ask the indelicate question here. Should the US or Haiti be looking to cut their losses and just accept someone like Barbecue walking into the leadership as that yes, he is a gangster and yes, he has a lot of questionable records, but at least he would control the majority of the country? Is that something that's currently under consideration? Everyone who could replace the current situation is in some ways even more problematic. I mean, do you have leadership by gangs? Do you have leadership by, you know, a previous coup leader? There's some talk about Guy Felipe, who, again, promulgated the previous 2004 coup. So obviously the US backing any candidate here is just opening up the door for a whole slew of problems down the road. But what about if the US went the other way? What if the US completely backed away from Haiti, stated they were not getting involved and leaving Haiti to sort this out themselves? 
what would be the likely outcome of the situation then? Absolute chaos. So we can remember that even with Haiti's neighbors, the situation has created immediate destabilization. One of the reasons that the Dominican Republic government has felt obliged to build a, a border wall and deploy literally thousands of persons from Ses Front, their border organization, to try to shut down that border is because of the sense that this, again, chaos and civil war and gang violence, the spillover into the Dominican Republic has a, a grave effect on them. When one looks at Jamaica, uh, the so-called uh, guns for ganji uh, trade, uh, just to name one thing, um, you know, the idea of, again, you know, Haitian guns going to Jamaica, Jamaican marijuana going to Haiti, uh, the perception that uh, w with Haiti, other countries, uh, the Bahamas, another uh, close neighbor to, to, to the north, is impacted not only by migrant flows and associated diseases such as cholera, but also, again, anytime that you have a ungoverned space, it creates vulnerabilities for organized crime routes. And certainly the cocaine routes and, and others going through Hispaniola, in which Haiti is located towards the United States, but also towards Europe, is, is increasingly a problem. And as we've seen in the United States, the problems that we don't deal with become ever greater migration problems. And so the issue with the collapse of, of Venezuela has turned into a major U.S. politics defining question of millions of, of Venezuelan out migrants. And so when you look at the situation in Haiti, again, the risks of out-migration, that impacting the United States, among other flows, the issue of the exportation of gang and corruption ties, even as we've seen in, in Venezuela and uh, in other places, the destabilizing effect on the Caribbean. And we have to recall that the stability of the Caribbean, which is the Southeast maritime approach to, to the United States, Caribbean logistics, Caribbean security, Caribbean governance, let alone questions of tourism, is of utmost importance. So aside from just the sheer you know, humanitarian uh, question of allowing such a unfolding crisis so close to the U.S. shores, it's also a, a question of essentially maintaining the stability of a region which is intimately tied to the United States and in its own uh, homeland defense and you know, not spreading ungovernability and, and crime there. And so Haiti is one of those problems that, for all of its intractability, is one that has repeatedly come up and has repeatedly demanded attention by U.S. policymakers as well as U.S. Congress. So, the situation is impossible for the police, tough for the intervention forces, and frankly, dangerous for the citizens. So, what is the likely outcome of this situation going to be? Is there a way of pulling Haiti back from the brink of either gang rule or civil war in the country? What options are feasibly left on the table at the moment? And which outside actors might be looking to take advantage of those? Well, to answer all that, we turn to our final guest. Part 4. A Fatal Future There are three things, Michael, that are different here. The first is donor fatigue. The UN, the US, Canada, also Brazil and Chile and others have been involved in sending missions to Haiti since, basically since 1994. And that's involved both boots on the ground, it's involved massive amounts of development assistance, and it's involved uh, multilateral forces, both security, but as well as tactical assistance. The second is the issue of the extent of criminal activity in the country. Yes, yeah, I can tell stories when I've been in Haiti in the past, you could see very obviously in restaurants and other places what were clearly narcotics traffickers and, and, and criminal dons cutting deals with their security guards. But now, of course, you have a level of insecurity and their level of control that is much different than even five years ago. And the third thing is, is the power vacuum created by the assassination of Moise. I think what we're seeing now is a greater penetration of the state by criminal elements and a certain level of greater brazenness that we haven't seen before in terms of their control of Port-au-Prince, 80% of the cities allegedly controlled by gangs, 60% of the humanitarian assistance is delivered by criminal gangs in, in the rural areas of the country. And that has really created a much more insidious relationship and, and network and even alliances among those groups that has existed before. So those three things I would say are, are very different. Donor fatigue, the level of insecurity, and, and of course, the vacuum that's been created by Moise's assassination. Chris Sabatini is the Senior Fellow for Latin American Studies at Chatham House. 
and a senior professor of practice at the London School of Economics. On top of that, Chris is also on the advisory boards for Harvard University's LASPAU, the Advisory Committee for Human Rights Watch America's Division, as well as the Inter-American Foundation. On top of that, he's also a HFX fellow with the Halifax International Security Forum, and has worked for everyone from governments to media organizations for his knowledge and work on Latin America and the Caribbean. Prior to that, Chris also founded and directed the nonprofit Global Americas, and was the editor and senior director of policy at the American Society on the Council of Americas, as well as being the founder and editor-in-chief of the hemispheric policy magazine America's Quarterly. To us here at the show, though, he's also the guest that holds the title of most appearances here on the program. So, as always, we're thrilled to have him back on the program today. When people allege some sort of invisible hand behind protests, whether it's Chile or Peru, Colombia, we've heard all these cases uh, in recent years. There may be a grain of truth, but we shouldn't use that as an excuse to overlook the root causes. I don't doubt that it could be Cuban and Venezuelan efforts to uh, sow chaos in these cases as a way to basically distract and weaken the United States to, if you will, try to weaken also international resolve to address these issues. There are countries who thrive and whose survival is contingent upon a greater chaos and and mischief uh, globally. So I, I don't discount that. But I do think we need to recognize that this isn't necessarily because of them. They may be adding fuel to the fire, But it's impossible, again, having worked on Haiti since 1995, to believe that this would not be happening were it not for the support of Cuba or Venezuela or Russia. A lot of the problems here in Haiti, particularly in the economics front, seem to stem from little problems that, when left unaddressed, led to massive big problems down the line. Even just a basic example that comes to mind here is the country's energy needs. As the country still hasn't solidified much of their power grid, with only about 38% of Haiti's population actually having access to electricity today. And even then, now the government has to negotiate with the gangs to keep that electricity on, as the gangs are currently occupying not only quite a lot of the power stations, but also the country's fuel terminals and the ports that fossil fuels are often bought in through. Now add to that the constant problem of capital just not coming into the country, meaning that there's no money to repair any of these power stations, and when you don't repair them, they become more inefficient, you have an exponential cycle. But what this situation has done is had a lot of knock-on effects in other parts of the society. As an example, because of the fact that it hasn't had this capital inflow that's allowed them to upgrade their power stations, or suppliers who are willing to guarantee flows of energy into the country, the population has largely been forced to turn to more inefficient methods of energy production. So rather than relying on things like coal, oil, gas, and renewables, instead for the majority of the population, about 60% of their energy needs come from highly inefficient charcoal use which they use for their heating, their cooking, and some of their basic energy production. And whilst it seems like a good stopgap solution to the problem, what it's meant is that Haitians have been cutting down trees at astounding rates for decades now, leading to massive deforestations right across the country, and taking a country that was once in the high 80s for forestation right down to, by some reports, nearly as low as 2% forestation. And this is one of the things I mean by the knock-on effects, as, frankly, not having those trees is far worse than just not having somewhere to sit in the shade. As with those trees gone, what it's gone and done is effectively hurt the crops, salt the waters, kill the livestock, and change a lot of the ecosystem that Haiti sits upon, whilst also having the added problem of people using the charcoal to heat their houses, pumping smoke into the house, which with the lack of ventilation throughout a lot of these houses, is going to have massive effects on the development of a lot of these children. So you can see how just small economic problems breed other economic issues further down the line. So what I want to ask is, When these outside states talk about how to stabilize Haiti or how to fix the problems that the country is going through at the moment, so how do these countries intend on creating a stable Haiti if they're not going to address these basic economic problems? When Haiti experienced the earthquake of 2010, Bill Clinton and George H.W. Bush pledged to build Haiti back better. Sadly, I don't make this point lightly, Haiti was not only not built back better, it wasn't really even built back. And the reasons were multiple. It didn't happen because, first of all, the infrastructure wasn't there. Second of all, the labor force was not ready. And third, the simply international investors were not ready to invest at scale, the level that Haiti needed to rebuild its economy. That's the first issue. All of those things depend on a certain level of economic development, of economic foundation that simply doesn't exist. 
the country has been denuded. Is there always a famous picture of uh, an aerial picture above the island of Hispaniola, and you can tell the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic is on the Dominican Republic side. It's lush and green. On Haiti, it's completely stripped. So you you also have a country that's been basically plagued by its own environmental uh, disuse. Uh, and then the third issue is when it comes to the economy, it's a level of education. One of the saddest things about Haiti, it's also one of the most inspiring, but if you go to Port-au-Prince and you're in the morning on the streets or in the afternoon, you see hundreds of Haitian children dressed up uh, in the white tops and the blue bottoms going to school. There's a great faith in education, a belief that somehow improving your personal and family's lot as well as the country's lot depends on education. But in fact, its system is below substandard. Teachers often not classrooms, classrooms have been destroyed or not rebuilt. And so you don't even have an educated workforce or population that can begin to serve as an engine to both attract investment as a means to create innovation and and as a way to to take over the very complicated tasks of governing what is effectively a, a failed state. So you mentioned the Dominican Republic there, and I want to unpack the DR and its relationship with Haiti for a moment. So when the island of Hispaniola was divided, the French got the west of the island and the Spanish got the east of the island, the French area becoming Haiti and the Spanish area becoming the Dominican Republic. Now, at the time of the split, they both had roughly the same soil, roughly the same climate, roughly the same resources, but Haiti, unlike the DR, sought independence from the European colonizers and in turn was smashed by years of sanctions, embargoes, lack of infrastructure being built in the country and interest payments that would continue to hamper growth throughout the economy. And just from those few changes during the early 1800s, today there are immense differences between the two countries. That whilst Haiti and the Dominican Republic have roughly the same levels of population, the DR is 10 times richer than that of Haiti. Haitian babies are also two and a half times more likely to die during infancy. And life expectancy in Haiti is nearly a decade shorter than it is in the DR. And if you're sitting at a computer at the moment, I do encourage you to go to Google Maps and just see how stark the difference is in forestation between the Haitian and the Dominican side. As the deforestation on the Haitian side is so bad, it can even be seen from space. Again, largely stemming from the fact the DR doesn't rely on charcoal and wood to heat and power large parts of the population. And in fact, in the DR today, rather than Haiti's 38% of the population who has electricity, in the DR, 98.1% of the population has access to electricity 24-7. And because of this inequality across the island, it has obviously meant that Haitians have continuously tried to emigrate into the Dominican Republic, causing massive tensions between the populations in the two sides. And in turn, the DR does keep its borders fairly shut to Haitians, and regularly treats Haitian citizens living in the DR quite poorly, even going as far as to change the constitution a few years ago to strip Haitians who'd got citizenship by birth inside the DR in an effort to make them stateless and push them back into Haiti. And these border tensions make things like using the DR's more efficient port systems a no-go for the Haitians. So we can see how just a few decisions made nearly 200 years ago have had massive differences down the line between these two countries. But looking at the DR, I want to talk about their role in this crisis, as we haven't talked a lot about the DR to this point. So what role do you see the Dominican Republic playing within this crisis going forward? The role of the Dominican Republic is going to be very delicate, both because it does not want to weigh into politics across the border. It's quite likely that if it is seen as being partisan on one side or the other, that violence and even the the sorts of uh, retribution that we saw with Moise could spill over across the border and affect Dominican politics in an election year. We have to add that too. So this is a very fraught area for the Dominican Republic, but also the Dominican history on Haitians and prejudice against Haitians and prejudice against Dominicans or Haitian, former Haitian citizens born in the Dominican Republic is not a stellar one. So it would be, I would say, unwise that they get openly involved, given nationalism, given resentment, and of course, given the criminal ties that could very easily cross the border uh, and affect Dominican politics. So I would be very surprised if the Dominican Republic plays too public a role. And I do think the international community cannot expect too much of the Dominican Republic in that regard for that very reason. So bring it back to Haiti now and looking forward to what the next stages are in this crisis and the current options sitting on the table for who could actually lead the country. As most of the options I see in front of me at the moment are very questionable the best, is there anyone that you could see that would be even acceptable to the majority of the public or someone that could stabilize the situation at the moment? 
There's really never been anyone in recent history who can unite Haiti. Politics are driven by clientelism, personal connections in ways that really prevent any form of consensus government or interim government. And to, quite frankly, relying on a criminal head to do that is even more fraught than doing it with maybe a politician who seems very Western oriented or with positive inclination in the United States. Criminals like Barbecue or Guy Philippe, their way of doing business, cutting deals, is through illicit transactions, building alliances with whoever happens to have the power, the force, the money. That's not a way to build a consensus-oriented government. And just referring to my own personal experience in Haiti, I remember going basically in the late 1990s before Aristide was returned. And the Aristide supporters talking about some sort of consensus government could reestablish essential guardrails for politics. And I would convene them and about 20, 30 people would show up and most of them weren't even talking to each other. This has persisted. And into this already fragmented, personalized mix has been injected illicit activities, transnational crime, turf battles, weapons. It's difficult to imagine who could sustain not just a support of the United States, but popular support or trust. So it's difficult. So what about the man currently in charge of Haiti, Ariel Henry? Will he be able to stabilize the situation and lead the country into the next phase? At the moment, he's declared a state of emergency and come out publicly promising to have an election on the 31st of August 2025, but that's a long time away. Do you think he can actually hold this state together long enough to reach that date in roughly 18 months' time? Or frankly, do you think the country's likely to hit its tipping point long before then? Henri is deeply unpopular. His legitimacy is questionable, both in terms of how and why he was appointed to be vice president just a little while before the assassination of Moise. But also, of course, his potential collusion with the murderers and also the fact that there is a plan for him to step aside February 7th, and he hasn't done that. And so the question is, will gang rule predominate? And will there now be some sort of ad hoc criminal coalition that asserts power uh, nationally? Do you think Barbecue will actually be able to unite these groups like he has promised to do? So he has already has a capacity. So I think it's quite likely that he can forge some form of a a union, an alliance that would take on any attempt, in his view, to impose a unpopular president who would be a threat to his interests or, or any other criminal interests. So what would you say then to someone who would suggest that the US was willing to work with Duval Gay during the Cold War? It seems somewhat likely that they'll just end up working with barbecue at some point in the future. How likely do you think it is that the rest of the region will just accept the situation on the ground and just start openly working with barbecue? It's a different world now. First of all, the, the nature of transnational crime is very different. Yes, there was cocaine trade and it did occur in Haiti, but it's much grander scale now. So drugs are much more global, much more prominent. Terrorism is much more of a threat, more global, more active than it was from the mid 50s to the mid 1980s. Money laundering, security across Latin America is much more on edge. We need to understand that the Duvaliers, who, who were criminals, who stoked criminal groups, the Tonto Makuts, were personal criminal militia, but it was much more contained. And I'm not justifying their support or their bloody regime, but transnational crime is much more international now. It's much more of a threat. It involves much, much more human trafficking. It involves alliances with other transnational criminal groups not just obviously, say, Train de Aragua of Venezuela or uh, any of the, the Sinaloa cartel or any of the many cartels in Mexico. And as we've seen you know, in cases like Afghanistan or Libya or Syria, the risks of a failed state are immense. Uh, and the idea of having a failed state, a profoundly failed state, run by criminal gangs in just a few hundred miles off the coast of the United States is unthinkable. So what should larger actors like the United States or France or Brazil be looking to do in order to help stabilize this situation? I think you do have to put together a real multilateral force for security. 
And that can involve the Kenyans, can involve the West Africans and the Caribbean countries, but they can't be leading it. It involves serious trained troops and materiel. It requires a multilateral commitment from the United Nations to support it. It requires a long-term plan of even working with these criminal elements and the Department of Justice the United States to try and even convict some of these criminals so that they don't just get recycled as politicians in Haiti in some future iteration of a semi-democracy. And that it also involves just massive humanitarian assistance to alleviate this and to take out the delivery of humanitarian assistance out of the hands of the criminal groups. You will have to deal with spillover. You may have to deal with insecurity, even in the United States, as a reaction to this, given the proximity. Um, but I think the cost of not committing real troops, real resources, and also not engaging in the broad international community, the EU, Brazil, Canada, yes, and Africa and the Caribbean in a multilateral coordinated effort is too high. You, maybe you can kick the can down the road and hope against hope against reality, that Haiti can pull itself together, or at least stay together long enough that it doesn't sort of blow up in your face. But you're only pretending that it's not going to be a problem later. And I know it's politically very difficult to deal with it now and in the way that is necessary. But if it isn't dealt with now, it will be an even larger problem two, three, five years from now. And do you think there's any chance that someone like the United States or any of these larger actors would actually go down that road and actually put efforts into stabilizing Haiti for the long term? Do you see anyone going down that road? I honestly don't think it's that likely. So if you're anything like me, the question you came to when you reached the end of this episode is probably whether or not you think Haiti is just forever doomed to this forever crisis, limited to deciding between rule from foreigners, usurpers, or gangsters. And I would like to think not but I completely understand why for quite a lot of Haitians, things must seem pretty much hopeless. After all, why would another intervention work? Why would more economic reforms fix the issues that the previous economic reforms caused? And if I were living in Haiti, I may not even be thinking about the overall economics of everything or what resource powers my power stations, but instead my priorities may lie with just security and making sure that schools and basic functions remain open willing to work with whoever can promise that as an option. But as an outsider looking in, I hope that not just for the sake of regional security or righting any historical wrongs, the most important reason to take the stability of Haiti seriously is for the well-being of the Haitian people. As, as much as Haiti's past has shaped what it is today, it doesn't necessarily have to shape tomorrow. We've seen other nations around the world destroyed by war and dictatorships that have then been rebuilt, improved, and flourished but to do so to prolonged effort and sustained focus by both the people as well as outside powers who are financially better off. If we look at a nation like Germany or Japan, after World War II, the US didn't just build the country to a point where it kind of stands on its own and then leave. They made sure to stay there for the long term, plan generations ahead, and give these countries everything they needed to have the best chance of achieving success. The fear I have is not whether Haitians could build upon a stabilized Haiti, my fear now is that that option will never be on the table. As unfortunately my worry is that after so many interventions, the international community is increasingly just giving up on Haiti, where nations like Brazil, France, Canada, who had once been big parts of trying to stabilize the country, now seem to just push Haiti into the too hard basket. The more I look into Haiti, the more I realize not just the tragedy of today, but the tragedy of what could have probably been that had we properly supported Haiti on the first or second intervention and really followed through with it, the Haitians would have a much easier road to success. But now down the road on the eighth intervention, we're finding these same powers putting in just the bare minimum, seeing it as somewhat of a lost cause and largely ignoring that these very moves will be the things that create the need for the ninth intervention. Thank you so much for checking out the show this week. I really enjoyed putting this episode together, uh, but production-wise, it was a bit of a nightmare. As a reality, we pretty much had an entirely different episode almost ready to go, and then all of a sudden, Haiti exploded this week and changed pretty much everything, signaling what the next phases of Haiti are likely to be, requiring some pretty serious rewrites, and I'm very sure that based on the readings of this week, we're probably going to be coming back and doing a part two at some time in the near future. 
And if you want to be made aware when we do drop that inevitable part two, you can find all our links and info on Twitter, Reddit, Blue Sky, Mastodon, Threads, Instagram, TikTok, Discord, and Facebook on the handle at the Red Line Pod. Or if you're keen to follow me on Twitter, I'm on the handle at Mike Hilliard Oz, Oz is in Australia. This show is completely funded by our amazing Patreons, who donate a small amount of money each month to help myself and the team keep the show going. And speaking of our amazing Patreons, this week I'd like to thank David Mayer, Alex Burkholz, Blake, Louis S, Josh, Warren Greaves, Breezy, Mac Dolly, Brian Goodwin, Dodo, and a big thanks to Fabrizio Napolitano, who are the latest patrons to sign up or increase their donations at the time of recording. This show is only possible with the support of listeners like these guys, and we cannot thank them enough. So if you feel you have a couple of dollars you could spare, and you want special access to content like our recent workshops unpacking the Taiwan invasion plans, or even our other recent workshop looking at the Soviet invasion plans for Europe, you can sign up on our Patreon today. Links in the description. But for now, this episode on Haiti is all thanks to you guys. And as usual, here are our three book recommendations. The first is Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed by Jared Diamond. It gave some great insights into how key decisions and economic factors really shape what Haiti is going through today. The second is Awakening the Ashes by this week's guest, Marlena Doubt, for a look at how the complicated history of early Haiti shaped the nation it is today. And the third is There Is No More Haiti by Lachlan Summers for a look into the underlying effects that drive the country today. I also want to say thanks to this week's guests, Marlena Doubt, Jess Tapira obert Evan Ellis, and Chris Sabatini. You were all so amazing to work with on this one, and we can't thank you enough for pushing all your schedules around so we could have the shortest amount of time between recording and release, so as to make sure that the episode would be as up-to-date as possible. And it wasn't just our guests who had to put in the extra work this week as the team at the Red Line also had to do a bunch of extra work on this one. So I'd like to give an additional thanks to the primary researchers for this piece, that being Robbie Sutton, Scott Missler Ferguson, Nick McDarley, Jemima Bentreef, Jonah Gunn, and Ben Nutter, for not only doing the research ahead of time, but also putting in the extra work to keep that research updated as the situation unfolded. In addition to those guys, I'd like to thank the rest of my team, that being Cameron Gale, the producer, Perry Grace, Daniela Juvella, Genevieve Don LeMay, Nadal Stiller, Nick McNally, Sean Cotter-Lem, Isaac Gibbs, Andrew Garbery, Scott Misler ferguson Jemima Pentreef, Ben Nutter, Mason Wise, Gabriel Lane, Lawrence Van Kielbilk, our research assistants and writers, Jamie Tanu, our media director, Raul Devanarayanan, our OSIN analyst, Francis Leach, our director of Breaking News, Mark Spencer, our second voice of our artist, Kashyap Maheshwari and Alexander Woolgarten from our online team, Jonah Gunn, our production assistant, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick Much, our field correspondent. And finally, the red line will be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you for listening, and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Redline podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.